All right, thank you every, I thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking some time out and joining us today. Uh, my name is Riyad Chama. I'm the executive director of the Institute of Youth Development and Excellence. And our vision is a world empowered by its youth. We see that there is the potential for every youth to really find and live their fullest potential. And that when that happens, we will see a world transformed. And I want us just to think for a moment, if every child, every youth that you know of was really living up to their fullest potential, what kind of a world we might have? I imagine we would have no crime, we wouldn't have hunger, we wouldn't have homelessness. Our youth are incredibly creative, they're motivated, they have a strong ability to get out there and take action and right wrongs. And that when they're really living to that full potential, they're actively seeking out ways in which they can better the world, better themselves, their families, their communities. And that's what we seek, that every youth in the world will be able to live to their fullest potential and thereby our entire world will be powered by that. I want to start off briefly by introducing our team. As I mentioned, I'm the executive director. My name is Riyad Chama. Uh, Mariam Martinez, if you would stand, please, is our program director, bringing many years of educational experience and working with us uh, from the very early years. Thank you. We have Inez Garza, Inez Vitan, our office manager, working with us part time, helping us stay organized and keeping things together. Thank you. And then Samia Chama in the back who's done our videography and video editing and helps all our training videos actually look professional as compared to what they once were, which was simply there. Why do we do what we do? We believe that we live in one of the most complex times in human history and that our youth are being neglected by and large, that they are not being nurtured properly. And we truly believe that the more that we invest in our youth, the greater the world will be. This is why we do what we do. This is why we push, why we are always out there, why we're always asking, why we are always encouraging people to get involved and to participate. And the way we hope to achieve that is that every youth should have a nurturing relationship with an inspired, trained mentor. Because we truly believe that having positive, trained mentors in the lives of our youth is truly transformational. When it's done right, it really helps bring out the very best in us. Just as any of us, even as adults, will think about mentors that we have in our lives, it's something that benefits us, knowing that we have that person to go to, someone who has some wisdom to share with us, an ability to help us get through our challenging times, and someone even just to really push us and encourage us to grow to that next step. And this is really what mentoring is about. But it takes training to be done right, to be done to the best of its abilities. There are some natural mentors out there. God bless all of them. But unfortunately, they're too far and few between. So we really believe in the importance of providing training so that people can do their very best in terms of benefiting the youth. And so this is what we do. We train mentors, identifying people who are willing to be mentors, and then train them so they can engage with the youth in a positive way. And we focus on capacity building for communities, helping communities develop teams of mentors who are willing to engage with the youth of their communities, because we also believe that the best mentor for youth is somebody from within the community that they're mentoring for. So our goal is not to train a million mentors in Cincinnati and then export them around the world, but rather we want every community to identify volunteers within that community who are willing to help, who are willing to participate and then to get the training so they can in turn have a positive impact in the lives of the youth in their neighborhoods and in their communities. So with that, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker today, Belinda Tabwalis. Uh, Belinda, if you wanna come on up, has been a honored and esteemed principal at the Rockdale uh, Elementary School. She's received many awards in the city of Cincinnati for doing a lot of community events, for improving the academics of her school, for establishing neighborhood programs, 
and just really overall helping make Cincinnati a much more awesome and better city. So with that, I want to turn things over to her. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Good afternoon. Again, just as my buddy said, Riyadh, I am Belinda Tufts Wallace. Uh, and I am truly honored to speak with you guys today. I feel so suited and booted uh, for such a time and for this particular uh, occasion. So uh, again, thank you. It's lunchtime. You could be a million places, but you chose to be here on this day, and I truly appreciate it. So looking at youth today, uh, coming from high school and actually with a background in social work, so I've been in homes where uh, kids were taken from home. I had to be the person to actually take the child from the home, uh, separate them from their siblings. And when it comes to chaos, children don't understand chaos. They just know that that's my mom, that's my dad, those are my siblings. Those are my siblings. So they really don't know when they're separated. So coming from social work and seeing that trauma and having such antagonistic uh, opportunities to engage in such, in such negativity. I wanted to be in an atmosphere where I can not, not only bless children, but be in an atmosphere where I can see them safe, where I can see the outcome, where I could bless them in a whole different environment, holistically and legally. All right, when I say legally, more of a natural manner in terms of what needs to be done and what has to be done. So coming over into education, I went into high school. And from high school, I uh, did counseling and um, vocational education teacher, uh, began to mold and just be into children. So it's my passion. I always had a, a love for children and youth. And now being an elementary principal, when we talk about the state of the youth today, it is totally, totally different. So when me and Riyadh talked about you know, the state of the youth period, we had a conversation. And what came to me was what's really going on is the issues of the heart. That's what came to me, the issues of the heart. I read a study this past summer, and I learned that there is a part of the brain when people feel emotional pain, there's an area that's activated the same as physical pain. So the brain doesn't really distinguish physical pain from emotional pain like we think. But if we see a victim bleeding, we're quick to come and give them comfort. We're quick to come to bandage them up. We're quick, we're quick to come and aid them based on what we see. All right, it looks dangerous, it's bad, it's, it's horrible. But when the heart is bleeding, we don't see it. And because we don't see a bleeding heart, many times it's ignored, it's taken for granted, there's no compassion, uh, that there's just no commonality with it. We don't understand why the person feel the way they feel and why they act the way they act. All right, so because of that, as a long life learner, I'm learning to be more patient and more kind and show more compassion despite what is going on with the person because I can't see their agony, just as we can't see the heart. So that's one becomes, even with some, there's that social rejection when a person feels that way. They are rejected. And today, our youth, they come to school experiencing all that. And as educators and people who are teaching these youth, they don't see it. And because of that, it's ignored. So when it comes to mentorship, people like you in this room and people that we know that are very suitable, they can be that conduit, that person they can interact with, share, all right, and really help erase the isolation. How long? We don't know how long they've been going through that, again, because we can't see it. Again, if it's an open wound, we can see it. And many times when wounds are closed, what happens? Does it heal? Right? When it's covered, it usually don't heal. At some point, we say what? Get some air, right? You can see the wound. You can see how it's, how it's healing. Uh, what area needs more medication? What area needs more support? And that's when a child share. You can see, you can hear what they're saying, you can hear where they're still hurting at, and then that's when the person could really um, help make a difference and give that person some steps, some tools, uh, advice, and other places to go to help with that. Also, it helps us determine that their major might be your minor, but your minor might be that major, their major. 
So what's heavy for you might be easy for them, and what's easy for them might be heavy for you. So these are things that are not taught in the classroom. These are not conversations that are going on with parents and children. But again, with that vested adult, with that adult they can count on at any point in time, these are the deliveries that we can help our children, youth, as they grow and they grow and they'll help the next person. This is all in those relationships when it comes to mentoring. I was also, uh, when I was thinking about this too, I came across one of the uh, psychosocial uh, constructs with Eric Erickson, Eric Erickson uh, regarding relationships, period, and how we need people. And today with social media, it's telling our youth, you don't need anyone but that tool in your hand. You can get your likes, you can order your food, you can play your games, you can isolate yourself, and when you're on that island alone, no one can help you. So the enemy can tear you down, do whatever because you're alone in isolation. And when you don't reach out to others, we can't help one another. And we all know when a person is dying or in trauma, or if they're there dying, the first thing we tell them is do what? What we tell them to do before the ambulance comes? What do we tell them to do? And what else? Keep what? Keep talking. Don't we say that? We say keep talking. We say keep talking, right? Keep talking. There's power in the tongue. There's life and death is in the tongue, right? So when it's so important that we have relationships. Relationships are so powerful, powerful. Relationships, relationships, and relationships. But we're living in a society today, today that tells us that you don't need relationships. You can do this by yourself. You don't need anyone. You can order your food. You can order your clothes. You can um, eat by yourself. You can zone people out. All right? And because of that, you are alone. And when you're alone, you don't get any support. But we know he didn't create it to be alone, right? Two cows, two goats, right? Two bears, two eagles. Right, he didn't, he didn't make us, we, we, we're, not supposed to, we're not supposed to be alone. Life is not to be alone and your life is not your own. So just being a part of this, coming to be a part of this conversation, we're gonna make some changes. We're gonna make some changes. Individual differences in accountable mentoring. The term is, is, appears so professional because Years ago, when we heard the term mentoring, we thought, oh, can I commit to that many hours? Oh, I have to buy somebody something. Oh, it's such a big responsibility. Uh, can I commit? But today, we need to start with accountable talks, just building relationships. And then programs such as this, you can get the appropriate training to give you more steps to be even more uh, supportive in an individual life, all right? developing skills to really designate and help that person go in the direction in which they want to go. But it definitely starts with relationships and a conversation. I had a young man that come into the building uh, just yesterday, and he said, you know, he donated some bikes. He said, you know, I really would like to become a mentor and come and do something with the kids, but I just don't know how to do it. So I just walked him into the library. There was two young men in the library that were in trouble. And I just left them. I, I just left them. I left them. I came back about 18 minutes later. One little boy was in his hair. Another little boy was down uh, looking with his shoes. And he was reading a book to one. And one young man, he was hand wrestling with him. And he said, you know what, Miss Wallace, I'm going to come back next week. I said, it's a natural thing. It's natural. It's natural. It doesn't take a skit. It doesn't. You know, it's not superficial, it's just natural. It just starts with good, wholesome conversations. So I was happy about that, because that young man was very concerned about having the appropriate training, which we will get that. We will get there, but it has to start somewhere. So I want you guys to not only know that you are needed, know that just stepping out of whatever you stepped out of today to come here, it is, is it's powerful, it's a powerful message that we are important, that others are important, and we want to continue, continue and continue to push mentoring, push accountable talks, push building relationships and let people know that it doesn't take that in the beginning to start building relationships. It doesn't take it. 
And before I ask uh, uh, my mentees a few uh, questions, I want to tell you about a few things that are definitely part of the State of the Union that I'm, I realize as a principal having a relationship with students. The holidays. What's different when I grew up, it probably existed when I grew up, but it's not as blatant right now, is, again, issues of the heart. We have many children that have different fathers in their home. They have several siblings, but they have different fathers. And I've had to explain to teachers that I know why Michelle's upset, because Christmas is coming, and Tierra going off with her grandparents who are rich. Rico dad is in jail. Cindy Yale had to go over her aunt's house. And Liera gonna be at home with her mom. That's why she's treating her sibling that way because she know every year about this time she's gonna be going off to California for Christmas break just as she did spring break. And that's not a conversation that students are having with their teachers. So when you don't know how to respond, you don't respond. You ball up, you fight, you protect. And anybody around you who doesn't know, you're just fighting everyone because you're carrying a chip that you don't think anyone understands about. They just don't understand it. So holiday brings a lot of emotional feelings for children that no one's discussing because they don't have that trusted person that even they believe even understand. So that was one that I just came across a few years ago uh, when I spoke to a young man who's generally just a great young man and I notice around the holidays when they always get crazy. Washington used to work get crazy, but he starts having tantrums and want to fight with his sibling. Another one, of course, is domestic violence. When children have to see what went on with their parents or their mother and this boyfriend, and they have to come on to school, they're carrying a worry across their mind for the day, worrying what condition did I leave mom in? Or what is it like for mom when I'm here in school? But again, you don't just you're, you're not gonna tell your classmate. That's something that's a good ear for an older or trusted adult to hear and give them mechanisms and strategies to talk about. And the biggest one that's new for me, oh okay. and the biggest one that's new for me, uh, and young people you can help me with this one. I have three of these cases going on. Uh, trying to figure out what's going on with these kids. And I just found the commonality. When your mom has uh, been mom and been a typical traditional mom for all nine years of your life, and now it's your 10th birthday and mom brings a girlfriend to the party, when traditionally it's been a boyfriend. So the very thing that you looked upon as quote unquote unhealthy or nasty as a kid and laughed upon is now in your house. And because of that, we had a young lady to run away because her mom is now, uh, is, has chosen a different life, a different lifestyle, a different sexuality, and the child uh, just wasn't used to it. Then I learned the same thing is going on with two other kids. And believe it or not, we're having, and they don't even know each other, but we're having very different behaviors in school and we notice that now we used to have mom and dad coming up, but we have mom and stepmom uh, coming up to the school for different visits. So different new things like that that are becoming very normal, and we're not realizing the impact it's, it's holding on our children. So again, that's another um, new uh, thing that's happened that you may be aware of. It's not really new, but just more revealed, and it's coming out um, with our students. And of course, media, the likes, it used to just be that I don't like you or you don't fit in, but now social media shows us what you should look like. It's, it's a way of bullying. You didn't tell me that I looked the part, but based on what's seen up here, I don't fit the part. So although you did not tell me, society has told me because this is what good looks like. And then we have, of course, the music media, uh, and I don't mean just the music industry, but in terms of the different media and your social media uh, outlets that our younger students have. So what I want you guys to know that today I stand before you as a parent mentor, because what I'm learning is that the little kids, despite what we talk to them about, despite what we suggest, despite what we encourage, which is still good, 
if they go back home to mom, she's still the primary indicator. So what I've learned to do with that as I grow older is work more with parents. So because of that, I have three parenting programs, but one parenting mentor program. And now that I have, my mentees are grown, they now work with younger kids because they're younger than me. And sometimes I ask them what's going on because I, I just can't relate like I used to. I just can't, I just can't relate to what's going on. That's, we just, what's cool, what, what I thought was cool was no longer cool. And what's cool, I still think is not cool. So that's not cool. <laughs> that's totally not cool. It's totally not cool. So I know that um, at this time, again, so I want to say, yes, you are needed. Every relationship counts. Uh, please don't think the best time I can't commit now because in the midst of all of this, life is going on. So you can never be ready because life, you'll have those uh, celebratory inter interruptions and you'll have those negative interruptions because we're living, right? And start a conversation. Relationships, be authentic in your relationships as much as possible. Uh, continue to participate in programs such as this for appropriate training and telling others that we need you, we want you trained because we want you to be equipped with what you need when different things come up, how to address them. And I'm so happy to partner with Riyadh because now that we'll have, we will have more different ethnicities, different backgrounds, different things to share, but at the end of the day, we all bleed blood. At the very end of the day, right? We're more alike than we're not. We're more alike. And we can merge the world as we embrace our, chi our children and make the world a greater place. So I'm gonna leave you with that, but I do want to ask uh, Miss Pleasant, if you would uh, come up, and Miss Gaines, if you would come up, and I just wanted uh, you to share, just, uh, it could be just one minute, uh, some things that Ms. Wallace can't relate to that you deal with that I don't because it's just not cool of some of the things that you guys are dealing with as you have mentees. So these are my mentees and I've had them since they were like 14 uh, years old. So the relationship doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. We refuse to let go. It's just like, it's elastic, right? It pulls, it pulls, but it, it's so natural. It never lets go. So we're just one big family. Hi, hi everyone. Again, thank you. Thank you to Ms. Wallace. Uh, thank you for acknowledging this work that she does so naturally and organically. And who would have known 21, 20 something years later, we're here. Uh, but my name is Carmen Gaines. I had the honor to be in Ms. Wallace's class in the Career Path program at Aiken High School in 1998. And I was wondering why this woman will always come to our class and preaching. Oh, my best friend Natalie, she's back there as well. But she will always come to our class and will tell us, like, you better get it together. You better get it. And we're like, oh, God, here she comes. Like, dreading every time she would come in there. But then we eventually had her class, and that's where everything started to shift for us. Um, our first introduction was her taking us to the college tours. And at that time, no one in my family went to college. I knew that I could go to college, but it just wasn't the reality for me because I didn't have that exposure or that experience. So Ms. Wallace took us on, our third, on the third annual college tour that she had uh, during that time, my girlfriends and I. And when we went, that was the light bulb. That was the switch that we need to turn our brains on and understand what our future could be. Uh, not only did she do that, but she would take us in her circles, her personal circles. Um, during that time, my father had committed suicide, so that was a very challenging year for me in high school. But she would take me around her sorority sisters, and she would take me around her family. Uh, she has tons of sisters. And for me, I was able to see black women in a different lens, through a different lens. I saw black women who were educated, black women who had successful families and relationships and marriages and things like that, but they were able to be themselves. So coming from a, a place where uh, not only uh, being able to um, identify what success looked like. I needed that support and I needed to know that um, I could do those things. So I later then went on to uh, college. I have an undergraduate degree in early childhood education. I currently work at Woodward Career Technical High School and I'm the career enrichment program coordinator in career tech education. And she <laughs> take kids that? around now. And I mentor <laughs> students as well. So I have 12 college graduates that I mentor and I do this in my work. So um, the difference with her mentoring us compared to now is um, 
having social media and having access to the world, the kids have no idea what they want to do. Everything is available to them, so they're not able to personalize what they're good at doing. So we uh, we witness a lot of students who will um, start doing one thing, and then they're not able to solidify and, and work through the process. Um, so for me, that is a huge difference with our, our students um, and them not being able to commit. So in my work, I establish partnerships and uh, creating those relationships for post-secondary education options. So if the students want to go into college, if they want to go into their career, if they want sustainable employment, that's going to support them. But they're having a very challenging time with committing to something. And I think with us, that was, um, you allowed yourself to learn. And um, I appreciate the fact that we have the world in our fingertips, but sometimes if the students are not coming from a place where they have that foundation and, and secure in their decisions, then they'll spend the next four or five years trying to figure out what they want to do. So Ms. Walls is everything to me that Carmen just listed um, as far as high school to now, but uh, my story is slightly different. So I had an undergrad in criminal justice, reached out to Ms. Walls, just chatting, and she said, hey, what are you doing with that degree? And I'm like, nothing, working at a nurse home. She was like, come on over to the school. And I'm like, school, I, I don't do kids. And so she pushed for a whole year, come on over. So I finally came over, and within that first year, I was like, oh, I found my calling. And so Ms. Walls encouraged me. I actually put the papers in my hand. Here's a master's program. So I went back, got my master's in special ed, and today I'm working as an integrated specialist up under her leadership, six school years. So not only was she my teacher in high school um, as an adult, um, she helped me pursue my master's and find my calling. Also, she was my daughter's principal um, from grades three to five, three to six. So she's my mentor, my daughter's mentor, and now I have a freshman in college who went to her alma mater, mm -hmm. and she actually pushed the belt for that. So she's my whole family mentor, <laughs> basically. <laughs> So uh, the power of mentorship is uh, proven here with Ms. Walls and I's uh, relationship. Um, and so for me, I, I would say my mentorship is kind of like unique. It's, it's not we like hang out a certain day or a certain time. It's when a student comes to me and say, hey, I need a break or hey, I need to hang out. And so it's really on their terms, you know, I don't schedule because you never know when they need you know, that time, it may be a good week. So if it's a good week, you know, I kind of fall back. But if it's a week where they need that heart to heart or to hang out or to go get ice cream, then that door is open for, for us to go and hang out. Um, one of the things that I personally see um, in the Avondale community at Rockdale is, is that our students are really struggling with um, brothers and moms and, and uncles and aunties are being shot. And now these students are trying to figure out how do I deal with this trauma? and still go to school every day. And by me losing a brother at the age of 19, all I could do was listen and just try to give them those uh, coping mechanism skills and just promote health and promoting um, talking and using your voice and just um, getting to a place of uh, trying to become whole again. Um, Principal Wallace always um, asks us, you know, for tips or pointers as far as, you know, where, where are our students now, just so she can you know, stay in the loop. She's in the loop. She says she's not, but she's in the loop. Um, so that's where I am with uh, being a mentor, a mentee, and thank you all for inviting this woman. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, Pearl, would you come up to real quick before <laughs> just one on uh, men? Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, it's my son. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. Um, so I met Ms. Wallace in um, the 10th grade. Um, I was in her class too. And, uh, <laughs> can you hear me? Sorry about that. Yeah, I was in her class too. And um, I don't know. Our relationship just kind of, we just got kind of cool. I don't know. Uh, but it was kind of different because. Uh, she wasn't like the rest of the teachers. She kind of, you know, she had her own thing going. You know, she followed the rules, but she kind of <laughs> did her own thing, <laughs> you know? And um, so I'll just say, just to keep it short, having her mentoring me has helped me 
not only see that ending step of where you want to be, but it helps you see like step A through Z. You know what I mean? Because a lot of times you see where you want to be, but until you see someone actually walking in, you know, their their like path and you know accomplishing their own goals, you don't really see the tiny steps that can take you to where you want to go. So I'll just say like um, she's really impacted my life pretty much since I've met her since the first year, and um, I don't think I think the power of mentorship uh, is fully explained through her work. And it's really opened me up to even just the idea of mentorship because now I look towards finding a mentor in every facet of my life. You know, where whether it's business, education, or just, you know, life. So yeah. you speak to the boys that are coming to school. They're all so shy. I wanted them to speak more about what they're doing currently with you. Uh, even the read, how Hurl comes and read um, to the boys at the school and building that relationship. But being cool, being a DJ, they can relate to a DJ and they can relate to the academic opponent. And then he comes up and party with them. And then he has a shirt on that says, I can read too, <laughs> right? I, I can read too. So just how they are given right back, developing those relationships within mentoring. Okay, so with my role, like I said, I work at the high school, but um, I started a girls foundation there at the school through my work as an entrepreneur uh, through health and wellness. So with my girls group there at the school, I typically identify a few students who have tons of potential, uh, but may not have that emotional social support. So we're talking about girls who may be in foster care, uh, girls who may be in a single parent home and it may not be as supportive of what they need. So for me, my personal success with that group of students have been uh, guiding them through their post-secondary option. So if you're the first, and we're, it's 2019, 2020, and we still have students who are the first generation to attend college. And we're talking about institutions that have been around for 200, uh, 300, 100 years. And uh, in 2019, um, we have a ton of students who have never experienced this. Uh, so with those students, I'll walk them through the process. If I have to drive up like Ms. Wallace did us and take them on college visits, uh, help mom go over to mom's house and help her create um, create the financial aid accounts and fill out that ap application to interviews. And I was also able to start up an emergency fund for girls who are going off to college that first year and they may have any emergency situation that could interrupt their studies. So for me, it's been very important to kind of bridge that gap so they could stay and remain in college. A lot of kids will go to college, but when they get there, they're like, wait a minute, this isn't fun, or this is more work, or they're, they'll get to institutions where they don't have the support, or they don't see people like them, so they'll return home. And this is typically in a PWI compared to a HBCU, and having that structure and support. So now, when I have kids who are going off to college, I'll make sure that I'll connect them with a former student, uh, or someone that we know in the community that can serve them. So it's always important for me to uh, help them make that decision along the way and avoid any kind of uh, issues or any trauma that they may be experiencing uh, so they can have a bright future. And that PWI is your traditional uh, white college mm -hmm. and HBCU, historically black college. Thank you, ladies. And I'm going to let uh, Riyadh go next with the panel. Uh, but in this moment, I would like my mom to stand. Um, I didn't tell her about uh, this event, but I'm glad she is here. Uh, so I have nine siblings, and then my sister and my niece is here as well. So I don't even want to count them, Mom. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'd like to have uh, Sister Miriam uh, come up, please. She's one of our parents. She has to leave, unfortunately, so I just wanted to have her go ahead and Come on up now, um, and if uh, Ibrahim and Enes would like to go ahead and come on up as well. We um, wanted to also have uh, uh, Sister Maryam as one of the parents, three of her children are in our mentoring program, uh, to speak to you a little bit about what she's seeing from the position of a parent, um, and then uh, we'll have uh, Ibrahim as one of our mentors, and Enes as one of our mentees as well. We just wanted them to share with you a little bit about 
what they found in terms of the power of the program, uh, the, the benefits they've seen in their life. Uh, again, I can say it all day long, but uh, I'm suspect because I'm part of the organization. <laughs> but that's why we wanted to have you have a chance to hear from others who have experienced being mentored and mentoring and seeing mentoring in their families uh, as well. So with that, I'll pass to Sister Marion first. Hello, everybody. My name is Marion, and I made the program two and a half years ago. So I was, I had three boy, three girls and one boy. Well, my girl was really kind of a struggling being in the school with the hijab, they really was really struggling. What they was doing, and they would wear hijab from home, get to school. I don't know if they was bullying about it, I don't know if they would take it up. But since they start going to the program, it really make them like, uh, give them a self-confidence. They really know who they are right now about their culture, their religion. So I'm really happy I find the program, and my kids join it, they are really happy. And now I use them as like, <laughs> My little game at home, so if you don't do your chore, you can't come to the program. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I really like the program. <laughs> Salaamu Alaikum, how are you all? All right, uh, my name is Brother Ibrahim. Uh, I know Miss Wallace was here talking. I actually, actually graduated from Rockdale myself, so uh, <laughs> that was about 16 years ago. <laughs> uh, so, al Alhamdulillah for the program. Um, I met Brother Yad. Um, I live in Florence now, Florence, Kentucky. Uh, so at the masjid, at the mosque there. So I normally just go and pray and go home. Uh, that's what I did every day. Go home, go pray, go home, go pray, go home. I never felt like I was part of the community there because uh, I only met the brothers well, when it's time to pray. And from there, we just go back home. So um, so when the brother we had, um, actually, he also does uh, some Fridays, some lectures there. So. When he introduced the program and he said, who wants to be a mentor? So I said, okay, uh, it's an opportunity for me to be um, part of the community and to uh, give my experience. It's not to give back because if I see it as give back, that means I'm not contributing to society. So for me, I wanted to be part of uh, the kids' life and growing up in Rockdale um, in, in the Avondale area and uh, some part of rough Cincinnati. And also being a Muslim, for as a man, it's easy to be a Muslim because I can just dress normal. Nobody knows. So as you mentioned, for the for the women or the girls, it's really hard because their identity is a little more different. So what I want to be part of the program was to help the young boys themselves to be um, when they go to school, not to be sh uh, shy to say, "Hey, I'm Muslim, and here's why I can identify myself as a Muslim." Because 9/11. Uh, thought it was all something different. Uh, for myself, I had to learn the religion because I had to answer questions that I didn't know. Um, I came from a country where being a Muslim is okay, nobody questioned you about your religion. So here, it's uh, with the program, it's, it becomes a little more practical because most of the kids, uh, they learn the uh, Quran, so they know most of that stuff. The difference is they don't apply it. So the program gives us the opportunity for, for them to know how to apply it and to have people of their own uh, similar culture and background in the same area to discuss. So on, fr on the Sundays when we have the program, um, we might pick a topic or something depending on what's going on. Uh, if it's a uh, holiday is coming up as Muslims, why we do celebrate this holiday, why we don't celebrate this holiday, how do you discuss it with your friends or how do you go about it? So it's an application part for it's practical. Um, so. If, Having a mentor program, as you guys talked about, and Ms. Wallace really answered the question, is it is really needed to have trained mentors because today as you look at society, even now kids are taking guns to schools and they're doing things that they not, they not should be doing at school. So for us to say uh, mentors are not uh, significant or not important, we can see how society is affected now, how the social media has really took it down to be an individual culture now. So it's, uh, for me it's a value, I want to be part of the culture, I want to be part of society, um, I want to help the community, and the program has really uh, contributed to that part for me because now uh, parents know me, Sister Amina is here, I didn't know her before the program, but now I know her, I know her children. Uh, so the kids, when they see me, they can say my name and I can say their name, I know their parents. So um, when I had a mentor, the big thing for me is I never wanted to disappoint my mentor. So, because I wanted to do well. So, having also mentees and you have a good relationship with them, that's one thing that can help them also say, hey, I don't want to disappoint my mentor if I do something wrong. 
you won't be happy or you'll be disappointed. So that helped me stay uh, do th doing well in school and also to stay stay out of trouble because I've been there rock that I'm sure you understand the trouble that the kids <laughs> are going through over there. So for me, it's very um, it's a it's, it helps me as well because. Uh, from work, family, and also something else I can do. So it's very important for me. So um, it's been a great uh, uh, part of my life. And I also have a brother in Sierra Leone. I talked to bro Brother Riyad. I also see him as a mentor. I came to him. I said, hey, here's an initiative going on in my country. What can I learn from you to do something similar to help out? So um, it's very, it's been a very um, significant value added to my life as well. So it's a very uh, good opportunity to give back and to add to the community because for me it's, I want to add my aspect uh, to the community. So the Islamic community in Florence area, I think the program has helped uh, to just bring a little more identity there. Other than that, it was just go pray and go home, go pray and go home. But now having these Sunday activities, uh, sometimes we do, uh, we go out or let's go fishing um, where some kids have never even done that before. Um, so we have brother Mike, who's also part of the community. Uh, we help some last week or just uh, two weeks ago, we we're just cutting out woods out in the, at the mosque. So some kids have never even done that. So instead of just being at home playing with your video games and being on your phone, this is the area that where the kids are playing and uh, being with their own uh, friends or other brothers or other sisters. And I plan a little bit of application of life. So brother Mike always believed there might be a day we might not have a garden. What are you gonna do? How are you gonna eat your food other than ordering on the phone? Are you able to grow a little garden to where you can plant your tomatoes and things like that. So he's always applying that knowledge and teaching the kids. And I'm also learning about that as well. So um, I'm very thankful for the program. So hopefully it's an opportunity for us to continue it in uh, Florence. Uh, so it's, I believe it's going well there. Hopefully there's a, and I've met people from Clifton as well because without the program, I haven't met, you know, I've met, uh, we've been part of the program going to Clifton there as well. So it kind of, join Clifton and Florence together because we've shared activities. So very helpful. So thank you all for that. And uh, I'm glad to be part of the program over there. Assalamu uh, alaikum, everyone. My name is Anas. I am 17 years old and I live in Clifton. So I participate in contact hours. Uh, we trained 18 minutes last year and 65 volunteers and have more than 1,500 hours of mentoring hours and 1100 hours of other volunteering time even like and so far being like maybe even like 10 years old or something i think what like everyone wants as a teenager even a kid is like a sense of value a sense of worth a sense that they matter but with the new advent of like social media and stuff like that being connected to everyone it's it warps people's mind of how you attain that self-worth because you go online you see like all these comments you see all these likes and you think oh that's how i should act that's how i should be like when in reality you're really harming yourself and really harming others because then you're spreading that onto other people as well and so i think with the mentoring program it helps with that because it kind of keeps you in check and it makes sure that you are going down the right path and stuff like that. And speaking as a Muslim as well, it also helps make sure that um, you stay on the right path of Islam and just make sure that you are the best person that you can be and that you can like really fully unlock your potential. And even then, it's like having a mentor is like sure like they can you know, teach you stuff like that, and like um, they have years of experience, and they can like help you guide you through life. But also, it's just nice that like you know you can have someone to talk to. And I think, especially like in these crazy times that we live in, having someone to talk to, like face to face in person, is something that should be more valued and should be like more sought after instead of you know kind of talking over the phone. Um, and doing stuff like that. So I think like, you know, I've been a part of this program for like maybe about a year or something like that. And it has been, it has been very transformative and it has made me realize the power of like being together and having people by your side and really connecting with other people and making sure that, you know, 
you treat everyone with respect and that you, you know, you just try and be the best person you can be and you just try and help people along the way. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. not fall far from the tree, as they say. Thank you. I just, I'm so humble and so thankful to all of you for being here. And I thought it's very important that I thank, on behalf of IYD, our amazing mentors, the parents without whom we couldn't do what we do. Because it's through their engagement, through their support, through their transformation, and becoming a deeper part of their children's life, of their community. And really through the mentees who actually transform us. And, and I think, and I was touching something very important and Belinda you did too, which is if you're not on the trenches, you cannot make judgments. You can make decisions and that's where we go wrong. When you are in the trenches, dealing with the problems that children face, dealing with this, um, and I, I, I discovered something amazing about Anas, and, and I'm gonna just use him as an example, I'm sorry. <laughs> He's very quiet and shy. And we had a, um, a program that was a theatrical production. And he shone, and he blew me away. Like, he was the star actor. But you do not know those things. You do not know the jewels, the treasures you have all around you, except that you interface with them except that you listen to your mentors when they say, hey, can we do this? Can we you know, plant some seeds here and wherever we are or create a machine? We don't know those things until we bring them together. So we are the mechanism that brings these people together to make magic, if I may say that. I don't know. <laughs> so I just wanted to thank you so much. And please, Sister Amina, could you stand up so that they see you as well? Um, she is one of the moms in Florence and soon to be a mentor as well. Kawaja, would you please stand as long, long, long standing mentor with us in the Clifton area. We could not do what we do without their amazing presence and dedication to the youth. So thank you so much and thank you for coming today. Of course, Quadro also here is one of our mentees in Florence. Uh, so again, all of you who are mentors and, and mentees, we're, we're very blessed to have you have you here with us. So uh, just to spend the next few minutes here to, to wrap up, um, the training that we do is two part. One is uh, online uh, because it makes it a little bit easier for everyone to have a chance to access the training. And then we have a live training which is a follow up to that where we have some discussion and role play to help implement the skills that we talked about and learned during the, the online training. Um, and then last year, uh, we were able to work with more than 600 new youth, uh, 8,000 youth contact hours, 
Uh, we trained 18 mentors last year, engaged 65 volunteers, and had more than 1,500 hours of uh, mentoring hours and 1,100 hours of other volunteering time. And so far uh, this year, we've served more than 3,200 youth, trained in total uh, 200 plus mentors, and have mentoring programs in uh, nine different states as well. So we're in the process of growing. We've been slowly but steadily uh, growing, and we have some new programs coming out as well this coming year. So we look forward to having everybody uh, participating and, and joining us, and hopefully you know, spreading the news. Our, our goal, again, is we want to see more trained mentors so that we have people involved in the lives of their children. Wherever they are, the program is going to be moving principally uh, online so that we can really have worldwide access so that any place somebody is, they can receive training on how to effectively engage our youth and how to help build them to their best capacity. And again, these are the core skills because every individual community has their own unique uh, challenges, has their own unique insights, and so it really requires mentors from each of those communities to be the ones that are doing the work within those communities. Um, Long-term impact, again, we see that mentors go on, or sorry, the mentees go on to do amazing things. Uh, so happy to have uh, Belinda's mentees here with us who have had a lot of success in life. But that's the reality, that when our mentees, when our youth have positive adults in their life, it really shows them the road ahead, that they know it can be done. It's not just me. You know, we had students who went from D students to straight A students simply because they had a mentor in their life who helped give them some direction and focus and an understanding that they could be someplace, they could be successful because they were seeing people who were similar to them in their backgrounds having great success and that was a tremendous motivation for them to realize that they could also have that kind of success. Our goal for this coming year is that we want to transform 100 youth by training at least 100 plus new mentors and we're also hoping to roll out a program for teachers to help implement some of the mentoring skills within the classroom, some advanced classroom management and relationship building skills for teachers. So we're gonna be working on developing that and hopefully getting that out uh, in some of our public schools uh, here, Atlanta uh, and a few other places. And we also are looking to offer the Arbinger Mindset Training, which is a very powerful training on how we shift our mindsets so that we can have an outward mindset so we actually become more productive and engaged and are able to better respond to different situations that happen in our lives. And of course, uh, from a nonprofit institution side, we also have some technology upgrades planned, hopefully to make things more available and accessible uh, and moving forward. So with that, typically uh, the cost overall to really help a youth through that whole process is about $1,700. It's for the training, it's for support. The mentors are volunteers, so they don't, um, you know, they don't get paid, but we do like to try to provide them with some um, activities that you know, we can uh, have the, the mentors and the mentees attend with minimal or, or no cost, uh, because we never want money to be a barrier for the mentees or the mentors in terms of participating and being involved and having experiences and so forth. So uh, on average, this is about how it comes out. So this is the fundraiser part. Um, it's gonna be very short because I don't believe in pressuring people. Um, I hope that everybody can see the value uh, of what we're doing. Ideally, we'd love to have um, monthly donors because that helps us in terms of our budgeting and it oftentimes helps people as well in terms of their own budgets. Anything is beneficial. Um, there, there, there's no you know, minimum amount. Of course, there's a donation, so there's no you know, requirement of anything. But we do ask for your support in helping us to train and develop mentors so that we can again have more positive adults in their lives. So uh, if you can't or it's not feasible or manageable to do a monthly donation, obviously one-time donations are fine as well. And the forms that are going to be passed around uh, uh, will have a spot so you can do a uh, credit card or, um, or check or if you know you're checking information, or if you would like to donate but you don't have any of your information with you, you can simply put your contact information on there and then give us an indication that um, it's a pledge and then I'll follow up with you. Uh, we are 501c3, it's a, a tax exempt uh, nonprofit. We're on the approved list of uh, nonprofit organizations on the, on the government sites uh, as well, uh, list of US charities and so forth. So 
that's out there, um, and that's basically who we are and what we're doing. And we are really looking forward to having you uh, join us as partners and helping to change the world. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer any questions.